Hello, GrowWire listeners, and welcome to the GrowWire podcast. I'm your host, Jason Maynard. Today's guest is Michael Smith. He's a VC with Seed Plus in Singapore. We're doing a little podcasting international style where we made Michael Smith get up really early in Singapore to do the podcast with me. You're going to learn all about managing hyper growth, what it's like to be acquired, dealing with that as you go through a, a, a fast scaling business, how Michael moved to Asia opened a bar, worked at Yahoo. Now he's a big time VC and all the big tech trends in the Asian market and what you need to do when you're gonna try and go sell products or services in Asia. Really good stuff, lots of interesting how-to, great stories. Michael's kind of an amazing guy and lived a great life, so I think you're gonna really dig what he shares with us. You're listening to the Grow Wire podcast, a place where you'll learn the ins and outs of growing a business, running a business, or even taking your big idea, career, or personal development to the next level. It's all possible. Our host, Jason Maynard, the SVP of marketing at Oracle NetSuite and the editor-in-chief of GrowWire.com, will take you on an exploration of growth through candid conversations with some of the most brilliant minds in entrepreneurship, entertainment, business development, and more. Whatever your goal, we know you'll walk away with the right tools to help fuel your own journey of growth. Before we dive into things with Michael, this episode is brought to you, as always, by our friends at Blue Microphones. Everyone has a story to tell. I keep telling stories all the time. If you're a storyteller, you probably know Blue Mics for their iconic Yeti microphone, which has helped millions and millions of people find and amplify their voice. So if you're thinking about creating a podcast, recording music, maybe you're going to stream on Twitch, who knows what you're going to do? Well, you better do it on Blue's new Yeti caster. It's the complete mic and boom arm system, ready to connect to your laptop, bringing the ultimate broadcast studio set up to your home or office. Visit bluedesigns.com and use the code PODCAST at checkout for a special GrowWire price. Now, I also want to make sure you head over to our website. We did build a website. It's not just a podcast, all right? Lots of great videos, great stuff you're going to find about growing your big ideas in your business. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you, Jason. It was exciting. So you and I go back. I've been back. listening to your podcast since, since lesson one here. Yes, we go back. <laughs> yeah, well, we go back. We go back a ways, and um, you know, back back into the early days of the tech. And I've seen you know in in the tech world, and I, I've you've you've always been one of the more fascinating guys I've I've known, and you know, I I I don't know a lot of folks who would sort of. Um, pull up their roots and and move across the world like you did, but we'll we'll talk about that and sort of what you've learned. But I'd love to get you know a little bit of background from you for the audience here in terms of you know you grew up in Sacramento. I'm a Sacramento guy as well. Yeah, we 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 made it out alive. <laughs> the mean streets of Sacramento. Yeah. So take it take us back to the late '90s here when you're working at at, at Web Logic. I mean that was a you guys were a hot startup. You you were, you know, one of the one of the the pioneers in this space. You know, what what were some of the things that you learned or saw, and that you think made the company successful and was ultimately acquired by BEA Systems? Yeah, I think you know, I think all of enterprise software was riding a really crazy wave at that point because I actually think if you look post acquisition of BEA and what's happened, in, you know, in your space and Oracle and all these things you know, the whole pricing models changed, right, to where it wasn't this crazy enterprise licensing models. I know some of that still happens, but not to the level that it used to. And a lot of stuff has moved to, like, SaaS or cloud or before you would buy licenses. So, But I think if you look at the, the way we were riding was all these businesses, you know, really were becoming their first online journeys. And what I mean by these is not the mom and pop getting on the web, but you're talking your United Airlines selling a ticket or your bank at looking, allowing you to check a deposit. All this kind of transactional stuff really hadn't been on the web yet to the level that it started to happen when the inter- application servers came on, right? And so we were that glue of, hey, you have the old world transactions, but you need to kind of just get them to a web browser. And, that, and that's what WebLogic was all about. And it was just crazy. I, I don't I don't think anybody will ever live quite through an era like that where you literally just couldn't keep up with the people that were calling 
you know, so you had inside sales teams, you had sales engineers, you had salespeople, and you really just couldn't keep up. Like, you know, no matter how big of a team we got, the numbers were a bit blown out. You couldn't keep up with everybody wanting to download and use the product. So we just, you know, and I was there when there was only two sales engineers, and we basically split the globe. I had the west half of America and Asia, and my friend Carl had the East half of America and then all of Europe. And that's how we actually divided the territory. <laughs> um, and they were just on a plane all the time selling. And it's just crazy. Like, And again, I think it's, it's a double-edged sword having that experience so young because you actually think that's how the world works and that's how companies are born. And as you know, it's not ever really that easy. The WebLogic story was amazing. But then when you were acquired by BEA it really sort of signaled the mainstreaming of this, this technology. Right. And, and you could argue BEA was, you know, it was an, it was an interesting little company. They, they own tuxedo, which was a product obviously that all the, you know, banks and telcos used for their transaction processing, but web logic sort of got turbocharged with that acquisition. And how, how what happened when you guys were acquired? You know, I, I've always, there's a web logic group and we always chat about when someone's going to write a book, because, you know, I think for some people this might be interesting, but I think a lot of people didn't realize that it wasn't as smooth as maybe all of you saw from the outside. So, as you know, WebLog- WebLogic was really focused on just pure Java and with this notion that Java could rule the world. And the BEA group was all focused on C and C++. Um, that was Tuxedo, and, and remember Mark Card just running all that, and then Scott running WebLogic. And there was actually kind of a, a lot of internal craziness around what programming model do you think the world's actually going to use? And, you know, the Tuxedo version was one of these programming models, which was object-oriented programming with C++. C++. And then Java was this, you know, this whole language could go everywhere kind of thing. Actually, the internal battles were quite big, and it was actually, uh, you know, wasn't that unified, to be frank, and it was this dividing line of, well, let's go see which one actually sells more. <laughs> and, and it actually took quite a little many quarters to where you finally saw the arc inside the company and kind of say, let's go, let's go nuts with web logic, right? It didn't happen right away, but you know, I think we hit the, you know, the web influx, the Java influx, all these things kind of confluence together at the exact same time to just go crazy. And then, you know, yeah, I think EA's majority of their revenues at one point came around to be almost entirely based on all the products that WebLogic was shipping, which, as you know, Oracle bought that. And, and a lot of the WebLogic stuff still lives inside of Oracle, even if it's been renamed, right? Yeah. What's what's fascinating to me, though, in, in this case study, if you will, is just how a company can, ha- can have one product buy a little product and an idea. And obviously, you know, you had a customer, a little customer base and you were successful, but introduce that transition into the parent and actually succeed because, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Yahoo and, and, you know, your time there, but like it's, it, it's very rare to see an established company, you know, dare, I don't want to use the word pivot, but, you know, make a change that abrupt with a new, with, with basically something that was competitive to what they were selling. And I, I I'm just curious from, from your standpoint, like, was that the key is, I think we were all pretty headstrong, right? And if you remember all the founders of WebLogic, like this was, you know, it was a big deal to go through with this acquisition. And it was, you know, there was trouble, I think, in some regard, at some funding rounds. And, you know, all things being said, it's amazing because, like, if you look at the acquisition, it happened when the VA stock was quite low, right? I'm not going to pull up the charts, but if you remember, the VA start stock was the lowest that it had ever been, I think, when the acquisition was done. It was all the right timing, I think. Yeah, I think in general, we kind of knew what we would do with it. But to be frank, you know, BEA also created an enormous amount of brand and trust. Because if you can remember, you know, we would go and sell to the finance. You know, this is before the collapse of Bear Stearns and all this stuff. We would sell these people and they would say, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll do some departmental work with this thing. But we don't know if we can really trust it because it's Java, it's WebLogic, you're a small company. People cared about support and all these kind of things. What BEA did by buying WebLogic is immediately all that went away, and that was the amazing thing for us, right? We didn't have to tell a bear Stearns that we did about our support problems or about our whatever because BEA was known for all that. So the amazing thing is we could take this new product that maybe people weren't quite trustworthy of yet to put their 
core business on, and the conversations about why you would do that suddenly went away. So then the uptake of the WebLogic product just was me like lighting a fire because all those problems went away, but we had all the normal kind of startup product things that made people want to use the product. And remember, Java was just getting iterated very fast. So it actually benefited both parties, I think, amazing well. And I think it'll go down. I'm pretty sure for Warburg Pincus, this is one of their biggest returns ever is because they were investors in BEA, right? Um, and I think because of WebLogic and kind of the stock growth, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you look at the Warburg stuff, it's still one of the biggest wins they've ever had. So I think it benefited everybody amazingly well. I don't necessarily think it was all thought out to be planned that way, but I, I got to hand it to the BEA guys for pulling off the acquisition and for the WebLogic people going for it because I think both parties benefited enormously well. Yeah, no, I think it's it's a, I think it's a fair analysis of it. Like Bill Coleman, Alfred Chuang, I mean that that will go down with for them as probably one of the greatest acquisitions and of all time and but but also making it succeed was really kind of the 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 yeah. I think the secret sauce there that a lot of folks haven't, you know, captured before. Everybody within Warburg knows about what Logic and VA because it's literally one of their textbook winners, right? So yeah. Yep, yep. And I think that kind of created this whole like amazing web logic kind of alumni network because everybody kind of knows that it was a it, you know you're not going to do something of that magnitude very often in your life right you know it's 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 kind of a one in a million shot right yeah no it was a special time we're going to take a quick break and and find out why you decided to move to Asia. Which American company started with a guy in a garage, was featured on Shark Tank, and now has over 1 million customers? Hint, they're reducing crime in neighborhoods everywhere. Here's Ring Video Doorbell founder Jamie Siminoff with his secret to success. It's true. In just a few years, we've had huge growth. We've hired hundreds of people, expanded our warehouse, and we're shipping millions of units a year, all while making sure our customers are happy. I've had lots of things to worry about, but I never worry about our finance and accounting because we use NetSuite from Oracle. From the beginning, NetSuite let me see what's going on with my business in real time. From revenues to expenses, customers and orders, even HR. I run my business from a dashboard right on my phone. NetSuite has been my business management system from 10 to a team of over 1,000. And NetSuite will be my choice as we continue to innovate and grow. Go to netsuite.com slash ring to see how Jamie scaled his business. You'll also get our free guide titled Overcoming Your Five Obstacles to Growth. That's netsuite.com slash ring for your free guide and the story of a great American company. netsuite.com slash ring. So, you know, so you had the big, you know, the big success at BEA with the acquisition. Um, you, You made a pretty bold move. And I remember you know, personally hearing about this from you way back in the day when you decided to move to Asia and, you know, it, it's, you know, we're talking a few years, a few years ago, what, 12, 13 years ago, you made the move? Almost, actually, it's almost 18. Almost 18. <laughs> oh my God. I got the math wrong on this. So, but I mean, that, it was more, you know, today that wouldn't be as crazy, right? Because if you look at the growth of China and everything that's happening. So what, what makes a Sacramento boy decide he's going to, he's going to leave, uh, leave sunny California and, uh, and head East. Yeah. It's so, it's, it's funny. This is where, you know, your the Scott Beeson stories come in again. So Scott was my boss post-acquisition and, and working at BEA at the time. So I was the CTO, right? So I I just was doing a lot of traveling for for BEA, and a lot of my travel was to Asia, actually. And, and part of me was, hey, I'd really actually like to dig in and get to know a region and a business skill even better than I do. That was really, and, and I love traveling. So I kept kind of asking for, is there some way now with the B office of the BEA being a big publicly traded company, can I go international? And it's quite funny, Scott was like, yeah, let me work on it. I'll let you know. And it took a while. And it's, you know, it's, the running joke was he actually came back to me with it. I got two cities you can go to. They both start with an H. What do you want to do? And, of course, I immediately figured one was Hong Kong because that's where BEA's Asia headquarters was at the time. This is, like you said, the interesting, all pre-China, right? You wouldn't yeah. go to China. You would go to Hong Kong. Um, and then the other one, I couldn't figure it out, to be frank, and, and I wasn't traveling to Europe that much, and it was actually High Wycombe, which is a suburb of London, which is where BEA has their European headquarters. Ah, okay. Um, and I was like, no, that's an easy choice. I'll go with Hong Kong. So, 
you know, and I, I wanted Asia to be frank, and, and it was partially because I did feel like with India and China, the world was going to change a lot, and I wanted to just be in the mix, so to speak. I don't know if I had a really grand master plan. I think I used to talk about wanting to learn Chinese and wanting to just try other things, but that actually didn't work out. But I did move to Hong Kong. That was around 99, 2000 when I was doing it a lot, and then I finally just stayed they put and, and yeah I, I really just felt like the tech world is going to change so much and Asia is just going to be a part of it that would just be a really interesting place to kind of restart or remake myself in, in just a different fashion right what, what was the market like then in terms of receptivity to you know U.S. products and just sort of moving you know in, in those days it was moving from you know client server to web I mean we're were they ahead? Were they really far behind? I mean, what was so, what was it like? Yeah, I think I think I think looking back now and realizing it, they were behind the kind of complexity and fast moving of the states at that time, in, in, in probably all regards. Um, but the interesting thing about BA again, you know, all you got to give them kudos. They had already done a great job of building like a distributor network. You know, we could go to Thailand and you could sell BEA. We could go to Malaysia and you could sell BEA. And, you know, that was something that WebLogic hadn't done yet. So they had this amazing network and brand. They also had stuff translated already, and they had local offices. So it was pretty easy to drop into that. And then what we kind of had to do was, you know, literally evangelize Java and the web. And for sure, the uptake was nowhere near like what the States was doing today or like Asia is today. So it was actually quite difficult. But at the same time, you know, you had Sun out there, uh, you know, doing a global kind of evangelistic move on Java itself. So, again, we were able to sit with inside that, the BA brand, and, and start moving stuff around. Um, it, you know, it was tough. It, but at the same time, there was this customer base that was dabbling with the web, but was also a BEA customer, and we would show them kind of an easier way of doing that. So, again, those same people would use it pretty quick. But getting the new kind of greenfield, as we would call it, things was actually quite tough at the time. It was just be a lot of a lot of sales calls, a lot of education to get it going. But, but the amazing thing I could remember is we would go do like a developer event in China or India, and it would always blow my mind. We could literally have 2,000 people come to an event with very little promotion at all. And that was what always blew me away was the volume of Asia. Yeah, and, and I mean, that was... Uh, so it's interesting. Did you, did you face more resistance from sort of the, the corporate-level folks than you did the developer community? It sounds like the developers were, were, on, were on board way before the, if you will, the suits decided this was the path. Yeah, and that was actually one of our techniques was just to really evangelize developers, knowing that if people were coding and using it, we'd get downloads, and then with downloads, you could kind of, you know, as we call them, sales, land and expand, right? Find one departmental user and, and build it out. So it was tough, and I think the other thing you'd get into, and this is the other thing that is, is still very different about Asia today, even, and you got into this whole game of the, you know, and everybody knows this in enterprise software, but it's not often talked about, which is the whole uh, geographic pricing type of games we get into, where if you're selling to, you know, the regional bank of Thailand, so to speak, versus, you know, uh, Bear Stearns in America, they're not going to be able to accept the same price, right? So so you would get into this type of, we would, did get the customers, but we weren't selling at the average selling point that, say, we would in New York, right? And it was the same product. So then you would doctor these things up with different kind of support contracts, but that was something I had to wrap my head around, which was we'd get usage of it and people would actually want to put their business on it. But if they were like a regional bank in a, in a smaller Asian country, of course they weren't going to be able to pay what you might pay for Bank of America in, in America, something like that. Yeah. So that's where we had to wrap our heads around. There was a big difference between usage and pricing. Yeah, that's interesting. What What was the hardest part just personally in terms of adjusting to maybe just living overseas and, and you know, kind of finding your way uh, when, you know, in, in a, in, you know with, with the level language diversity and just, you know, kind of making, just sort of making your life over there? Yeah, so I think, uh, I didn't find actually living to be that hard. And I think mom would always, 
my parents probably worries about if I would eat or not, but anybody who traveled through Asia realizes that these people eat all the time, right? So <laughs> there's food everywhere. So so I'd always tell my mom, my like, mom, don't don't worry about the food. You know, there's, it's everywhere. Everywhere you walk, there's food. So um, you know, getting used to the heat actually took a few years. You know, you, the humidity and all these things is just something you're not used to. Um, but I think more the thing to really wrap your head around was office culture. Actually, I think that's the tough one because I think I came from San Francisco in the Valley and people would work odd hours and, you know, you were, you, there was this confluence of engineers and salespeople all in one building, all kind of working together like as a hive mind. And then when you shifted over to one where engineering wasn't there and I was kind of on my own when it came to technical stuff, but at the same time, the culture of like, you know, you're in Hong Kong and everybody's still in their seats at say six o'clock because the boss hasn't left the room, but actually they're not working, right? And, and little things like, why, why are we doing this? And so you get into the whole culture of how hierarchies work and how faith works and things that I even see that are now changing today in Asia because the startup culture has been exported kind of across the globe where people now work the odd hours, they do whatever they want. That wasn't really happening when I showed up, right? It was the, you know, we were an American company with an American product, clearly sitting in an Asian cultural society. And that for me was actually, you know, I think I probably was like the bull in the China shop initially because I thought I could change everybody or I thought I would just do it my way. And I, and I really had to take a step back and, you know, integrate a little bit more and, and do it the, as the team way. And that was a big lesson for me. Yeah. You, you, you stayed at BA for a while and then you, um, you decided to take a little bit of a, of a, of a different path. Um, <laughs> a journey, a journey. <laughs> and, uh, I, this, this one is, you know, this was kind of fascinating, but you decided to open a, open a bar after you left BEA. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I always try to tell people like that's actually wasn't the intent. So what really <laughs> happened and I, I kind of chalked this up to, a midlife crisis in my, like, 30s, I I was on the plane all the time, and I was their typical, you know, advanced kind of sales engineering drone slash CTO slash evangelist, you know, where every meeting I'd land to, I had my seven or eight prepared decks. I could talk to anybody about everything. I knew I was selling. And I don't know, I, I literally just had a night where I couldn't sleep, and I realized that, like, I'm just doing the same thing every day, every day. And yes, I'm getting paid well for it, and I'm not going to complain about my life. But at the same time, I was like, is this really what I want to do every day? And, and am I growing and learning? And I think at that point, BEA was actually, you know, we, we were expats. They wanted some of the expats to actually shift around a little bit. There was even, I was spending more time in Beijing versus Hong Kong. I just wasn't really having fun anymore. So I decided to just, pull the ripcord, so to speak, and, and do something different. And what I decided to do, and I had some regret about when I was living in Hong Kong, never actually learning Chinese. I tried, but I couldn't keep up with the lessons, and, and I, I didn't make it a priority. I wanted to move to another Asian country. I wanted to make sure I learned a language, and I wanted to kind of just figure new things out, see if I could remake myself. So I chose Thailand because actually it was the easiest place to kind of get visas for, it was cheap. I, I thought the Thai language was interesting. So that, I just chose Thailand, and I kind of landed there, stayed in a very cheap apartment that was where the Thais live. I actually started going to language school every day. Now I'm, I'm fluent in Thai. And, I, you know, that was, the, that was actually what I was trying to do. The restaurant bar thing kind of happened because I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't think I wanted to start a tech company. And, you know, it just happened between a few people I met. It's just one of those things where next thing you know, I'm, I'm owning a bar and we need to run it. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. And that's, and that's, and we actually ended up owning a couple. They're like pubs and you know, you could talk for two hours. I have a lot of notes about this. So it's probably a book someday, but you know, I've learned a lot through it. I, I can say financially it wasn't rewarding. Um, it, it, if anything, it's cost me cause there's, you know, that many years of, not having a high paid tech salary coupled with basically keeping the bars running out of my own pocket, you know, but the crazy thing is from all of that, like when you talk about someone getting an MBA or something that really was MBA for me because 
I, I learned a lot about employee management. I learned a lot about financial stuff. I learned a lot. I mean, I had to deal with the mafia. I had to deal with almost a night in jail. Like, the stories go on and on. What I came through all that was a much less hot-headed kind of aggressive tech person. I became much more, more empathy for people. I became much better at managing people. I became much better about dealing with things because I deal with the government and police. And all. Like, like the lessons I learned from it were amazing, even if financially it was kind of a really silly thing to do. <laughs> you know, though, but it's, it's those things in life sometimes that are the ones that teach you the most. So it's, it's you know, never no regrets. It was the school of, school of hard road knocks for sure. And there's no regrets. I mean, it's crazy. There's lots of fun stories. I still have friends with people I've met through it. And, you know, it's, it's, Part of me wants to erase it. The other part of me realizes it, it was very formative. But, you know, yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't know how they kind of put a, a description on why it happened and how it happened. It just really just kind of happened to me, and then I, I, I got sucked up into it. But what I've learned from it is quite amazing. And, you know, and I have a, a lot of affinity for Thailand, which is actually quite interesting because Thailand, out of the four or five core cities in, say, Southeast Asia, is just one of the hottest startup markets going right it's kind of insane where when i was there that wasn't even thought about yeah so so you obviously you know moved on from that but you you spent some time at yahoo and you know the 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 yahoo's yahoo's fascinating to me because you know we talked earlier about how bea you know much smaller company obviously um but they found a way to you know change their business with an acquisition and and go in a different direction and and it's hard to do yahoo perennially struggled with that right in terms of are they a media company are they a tech company what was your experience like in from in in yahoo especially during that time and and actually and being overseas yeah and it's amazing because actually so yeah this goes back to the network i actually was needing to basically get, get employed again, I'll be frank. And I called into the network, and thankfully Scott Deaton was still at Yahoo at the time. Uh, you may know Sam Pallara was there. Actually, Sam's at Sutter Hill now. He's a VP as well. And I, I was just like, hey, guys, I need to get back to work. I'm living in Thailand, but I'll move anywhere in Asia. <laughs> and they were like, hey, let's get you over to Singapore, see if we can find something. And they, and they basically parachuted me into Singapore, and I got a job, which is fantastic. The interesting thing is at the time that I landed at Yahoo, within Southeast Asia, Yahoo was at peak numbers, like crazy. You know, in places like the Philippines, Yahoo Messenger was like 80% of all Internet messaging. Uh, Vietnam, actually, we ran a social network. A lot of people don't know that. This is pre-Facebook, so it was called Yahoo 360. It was the dominant social network in Vietnam. So it was this crazy thing where I could land and basically be like, oh, my gosh, I'm working for the hottest internet company in Southeast Asia and happens to be Yahoo. Now, at the same time, in America and the other Europe, Yahoo was already waning. Um, and it was this, and that was, when, you know, and it, again, I don't like to blame a lot of this on Carol Bartz. I think she was handed a lot of this. But I was there when Carol was there, and we were basically trying, and I, and I actually got to work on projects with Jerry Yang, which is another, you know, awesome experience I've had. Um, and we were actually trying to take the Yahoo assets in Southeast Asia and refactor them to do more. Um, and, you know, it's just a textbook case of, I, I, you know, and maybe a lot of people, there's a lot of, how do you figure out when something's at its peak to basically keep it from reversing? And, and I think, you know, your Googles and Facebooks of the world have never experienced this, or Amazons, because they seem to be just keep going up and up and up. But Yahoo, for some reason, either it was old school or the way it's run, you know, basically hit a peak and then just went all down. And I think, it, it, you know, apart from it being bought and running in America, it is literally just keeps going down, right? And I don't know how you fix those problems, but it's a textbook case of probably all the things not to do in the Internet is all I can say. Yeah. When you're in the part of the business that's doing well, um, it's obviously was much smaller than the core business in North America. Um were there lessons uh, in the Asian market that you thought were maybe exportable back to the U.S., or was the success there, do you think, really more of a reflection of sort of where Asia was in terms of utilizing, you know, social and search and basically the sort of the core Internet properties? Yeah, and I think, so, 
and I think the one thing you have to juxtapose is that the unfortunate side effect was that our doing well, though, wasn't generating enough revenue, which is something you'll see a lot in the Asia paradigm, right? Yeah. Where in America, your, your ad rates could maybe slow the company around here, not so much. So, you know, yeah, there were definitely things to learn. One of the things that we were, we were taking back up to Sunnyvale, which is my job, which is, oh, my gosh, it's all mobile. It's all mobile. It's all mobile. Like, you know, you guys keep having these desktop-first experiences. These people in Thailand don't have a desktop. They, the mobile is, is their first computer. So one of the things we were seeing right away is the first computers were phones um, and that you had to design for that. And Yahoo was woefully behind in that. That was one of the things we saw. Um, the other thing we saw is just the, the cultural nuances and how it affects products. But I think the way I used to tell people is if Yahoo was running Facebook, it would look different in every single country, and they think that was good. But if you see what Facebook does, it's like a language toggle and nothing else, right? So there, there were things to learn where Yahoo kind of over-engineered its ability to, to cater to each product, which became a big burden, right, a big engineering, a big product burden, which is something you don't see the Googles and the Facebooks do. Uh, they basically build the same product. It goes everywhere. You just toggle the language. So that's some of the lessons we learned that Yahoo kind of overemphasized trying to cater to the market, but didn't cater to the fact that it was mobile first, hmm. and even things like trying to design the network so that we had good performance in Southeast Asia versus kind of everything coming from America, that kind of stuff. So we were catching up on all that, but I think we weren't able to iterate as fast as what the big giants were doing when it came to just being mobile first, very fast, and iterating very quickly in products specific to each country. And, and those two things crossed in the night, and there was just no going back, in my opinion. Great. We're going to take a quick break and talk about how you moved from tech startup world into uh, on the operating side and becoming a VC. If you've ever met a famous athlete at a corporate event or gotten an official autograph, chances are Steiner Sports made it happen. Here's Brandon Steiner. We believe that there's magic in the moments that sports creates. We get customers closer to the game and help companies use the power of sports to grow their business. We've been in business 30 years and we've had multiple systems to keep track of all the athletes and all of our customers. Multiple systems means multiple headaches. So we made the move to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite lets us replace all of our finance, inventory, and CRM functions with one convenient system. Now all the departments can see the same data. And if I have a question about our business, I can get the answer quickly. Find out how Steiner Sports scale their business to millions of customers. Go to netsuite.com slash Steiner. You'll also get our free guide titled Overcoming Your Five Obstacles to Growth. That's netsuite.com slash Steiner for our free guide and the story of a great American company. You worked at Yahoo. You did a couple startups as well in 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 Asia. Um, but but what, what's fascinating is you you made a move here recently uh, onto the venture side and working for Seed Plus, which is a seed venture firm in Singapore. You know, after being you know a tech operator for so long, how, how what's the transition been like for you? Yeah, it's 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 tough. I think. You know, so one of the things I realized was throughout all my life, and actually if we wind back to WebLogic, I've been kind of touching the VC space since literally day one because the funny thing was, you know, just really quick on WebLogic, I, I, when I would get my support calls in, I was actually talking to Paul Ambrose, which is the founder of WebLogic. The founders would actually do support at that time. And Paul called me one day and said, hey, a VC is looking at doing some due diligence on a round in WebLogic, and you talk to them. I talked to them for a couple of hours. I think they ended up not doing the round. But actually what happened was Paul said, that VC said, you guys should hire that guy. He really knows your product. And that's how I actually got the web logic. Um, so I've always been kind of touching this space. And at BEA, I was involved in corp dev. So like some of the acquisitions and some of the strategy around acquisitions, that was interesting to me. At Yahoo, actually, I worked with uh, a gentleman named David Gowdy, who was doing all corp dev for emerging markets, and we actually acquired an Indonesian company for Yahoo, which was, you know, didn't get a lot of press in America, I think, but actually was huge around here because it was the first time a Fortune 500 internet company had acquired an Indonesian startup. And actually, if you go to any private equity venture capital 
conference in Asia, literally to this day, if someone shows you a chart of the Southeast Asian ecosystem kicking off, one of the very first deals is actually my deal at Yahoo where we bought this company called Corporal. And, you know, it, it lives in infinity to this day because it didn't turn out to be a big deal. But when it came to the ecosystem getting put on the map, it was a huge deal. Um, and actually, that was mine and David's deal. So I was involved in that stuff. And that, that was actually quite interesting for me because I, I really enjoyed the, the framework of building and buying. Um, and then I went and did some consulting work regionally for TPG Capital. So I just kept being around the periphery of this stuff and realizing that I find it super, super interesting, but I, I knew I didn't know how to do it per se. So I got really fortunate, kind of back to a network effect. David Gowdy had moved to a firm uh, called Jungle Ventures, and he called me and said, hey, we're kicking off this seed stage fund, and we'd really like to have someone with an operator background help us with it because we think that's important to startups. And so really fortunate, I was able to kind of move from pure operator over to VC, um, actually help raise some of the money a little bit. Uh, I'm managing the portfolio and the deals. You know, so it's kind of out of the frying pan and the fire around VC. And, you know, I definitely think my experience of being an operator and helping founders is huge benefit. But the amazing thing with VC is just all the other things you do to kind of find deals and close deals and manage, uh, uh, you know, the financials of the fund and manage the portfolio. It's, it's massive, right? I, I, I knew it was big, but now that I'm wrapping my head around the whole thing, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, and I'm still kind of wrapping my head around how does someone in my background be the most effective in this world? Because it's not always just about helping the startups, right? We have to do everything. Yeah. Um, what what surprised you the most? Is there anything that, that kind of stands out that you go, gosh, you know what? I wish I would have known this, even if it was a year or so ago, to, to make um, the transition. Yeah. I think the stuff that surprises me the most is, you know, you, you really get involved in in really helping the startup do stuff. And I think, you know, I didn't realize how much the, how much the, the startups need help, right? But the other thing, the other thing that I, I think I, I'm trying to wrap my head around a lot is just the financial stuff, right? I think a lot of people don't realize when you're running a fund is really getting involved in, you know, all the stuff to kind of manage money, right? And I think, you know, you've been in, in the investment finance side, and a lot of times people think, you know, VC is just find great startups, write checks, help them, startups exit, VC's happy, right? If I make it really simple. But the whole aspect of, like, one, raising money from LPs to managing your LPs to managing the funds itself, you know, and the things you get into around even, you know, when we write checks in another country, currency exchange, and the legal framework around, you know, for an example, like, I made an investment in a Thai company. It's called Kiklo, you know, and it's a Hong Kong holding company, a Thai company, and we've recently opened up a Delaware Corp, and they're starting to sell in Delaware. And there's all these aspects we get into of the the legal stuff and what's the best way to set up their company and what's the best way to help them on market entry. You know, that kind of stuff, is, I didn't realize you get so into that, which is which is quite fun, right, because you're basically – you're almost like you're a part of each and every one of these companies. And I think that's why a lot of VCs will tell you it's exciting, right? It's, you're not just working with one company. You're working with everybody in your portfolio. Yeah. What, what, what have you found from a venture standpoint um, with the Asian market relative to, you know, what, what you've seen in, in, in the U.S. market? I mean, is it you, – you talk about an ecosystem, but, I mean, are you seeing that level of ecosystem develop in each country or is it, you know, is it – more more mature in one place than the other. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely it's it's not what the states is, and I think a lot of people sometimes look at the states and just assume that everything is like that when it comes to startups and tech and investing, and it's really not. And I think everybody knows from a global perspective, you know, kind of how how big China is and how big India is. You know, and Southeast Asia is. You know, if you look at Southeast Asia as a unit, which is kind of what happens in this part of the world, you know, and it's very similar to the enterprise market where where you talk about, you know, Japan's its own region and Korea's its own region. 
that's generally even how we have to deal with stuff as a VC because they're all very separate entities. But for sure, it's not as frothy, I think, as America. And I, and I say that with, you know, when you look at these crazy rounds and crazy valuations, you don't see that as much in Asia. Now, you do see some of it in China. You definitely see some of that in, in other parts of the world. But, you know, I would say that's not the norm here. And I think some of that is tied to the fact that what you have in America, um, you know, Mark Cuban talks a lot about this, is the liquidity, right? You have this amazing ability where Oracle can sweep in and say, we love this startup, we're paying $4 billion for it. Um, that's what's not really happened yet in Asia. So because of that, all of it's kind of pressed down a little bit that what you see is more normal fundraising rounds. You see exits at a much later stage. And then you see a few of the companies actually trying to go public, but they choose the uh, foreign markets to go public in because the Singapore Stock Exchange or, say, the Thailand Stock Exchange is quite small. Mm-hmm. So I think in some, in some extent, what America has is such a, a large amount of liquidity that that's created a little bit of a, you know, an exit opportunity at the top end, where in Asia, that's not quite there yet outside of China. Yeah, and... How does that how does that change the way you you would build a company in Asia? Because you know if you if you you know if you're here where I am right now in in the heart of Silicon Valley, you know there, there's a huge war for talent. Developers are expensive. You know, trying to build a sales organization costs you gobs of money. I mean, what what's that like in terms of actually building a team? Yeah, so I think in general, some of the the, the, the same problems exist. Like what I tell people, any any great city ecosystem, you're going to hear everybody say, oh, it's so hard for me to get developers, right? So I think the, the world over, developers or engineers are in demand, and that's just a known entity everywhere. Um, but, you know, they're not getting the $300,000 packages you hear that they get at, like, Facebook or Google. So developers is kind of a constrained thing, I think, around the world. That's just a normal phenomenon. But, you know, when it comes to the prices of some things, you know, for an example, you'll have regional companies here build their entire engineering team in Vietnam. And, you know, it'll be some one third, one fourth cheaper than doing it, say, in the States. Um, But when it comes to some of your other things, like if you want to live in a metropolitan city center, you know, you're going to have some of the costs normal costs associated with it, but nothing you're going to see is like the valley, right, where it's very expensive real estate, very expensive housing. So, you know, but I think when it comes to building market and and what we see is, you know, companies that either try to be very regional, you know, it's it's a product that you'll see all across Southeast Asia or maybe Asia, or you'll see products that say, you know, they become very dominant in, say, one country. So an example of this would be, like, you may have heard of, like, guys like Gojek in Indonesia that literally are massive, and they're really, at right now, only in one country. So it really depends which countries and kind of cities you're looking at, but we generally feel that, you know, cities are driving growth, um, and a lot of times you'll hear us not talk about countries as much as we talk about cities and kind of how cities take to products and how cities can build a market for you. And that seems to be how people kind of look at Asia um, is this city infrastructure and kind of how many people are in cities, the cities keep growing, and what are the things that you can sell to people in these cities? And we think that's driving a lot of the force. And, of course, what's just always very different sometimes in America is it's always almost mobile and it's always more alternative payment infrastructures where in America there's just the assumption that everybody has credit cards and everybody has banks. That's not the case in Asia, right? A lot of these people are unbanked or don't have credit cards. So alternative payments and mobile are like the main thing here, where in a lot of other parts of the world, that's not usually the first problem. Yeah. So I, I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you, you know, for, for folks who are in the U.S., and maybe they're you know they're venture backed or or even if they're not venture backed and they're kind of smaller businesses you know you've seen all of asia what's what's some of the best advice you can give to companies looking to expand to the asian market yeah i think they have to realize that there definitely is a market here i think sometimes people just keep 
between a bat. But what I but I would caution people to understand what they're selling. So a lot of times, if we think of certain product spaces, like let's say enterprise software, I still think an enterprise software company is probably going to get their biggest sales at what we call the developed market. And if you're an enterprise software company, you know that's America and maybe Europe and maybe Asia third, to be frank. But if you're you know in other spaces that where these things can work anywhere. You kind of definitely have to know that Asia exists, but I think you really have to break Asia down and, and realize, you know, if you look at the oracles and all these people, you know, they've always had this journey of what they do in Japan is very different than say what they do in in South Korea, for example. So I think the first thing I tell people is stop looking at Asia holistically. Like you can't just say we're going to Asia. No one really believes that because there is no such thing, right? So we try to tell people is. Where, where are you trying to go and where are you trying to enter? And then you're probably better off entering, entering uh, you know, a place like a Singapore, for an example, or a place like a Hong Kong, where it's kind of an English spoken place. Setting up a company is very simple, you know, and you can kind of build a beachhead to get your arms around Asia. You know, we usually tell people, you're probably not going to enter China. It's much harder than you think. Uh, you know, unless you're getting amazing uptake in Japan, you're probably not going to enter Japan because you need to kind of put everything in Japanese. You need to really understand their culture. Um, but if you look at Southeast Asia or, say, India, a few of these places, you know, and using the cities like Hong Kong or Singapore as, as beachheads, you can kind of set up a company pretty easily. It's all going to be done in English, and you would be able to kind of figure out where you're selling to and really pick apart maybe a city at a time from the central location. And I think that's a safer way to kind of play Asia and look at it versus just that we're going to Asia or we think we might do this because culturally and with language, each country does kind of operate a little bit differently and to kind of tackle them holistically normally leaves people on the losing end of that battle because what they find is they can't really tackle it holistically. They pull back because they think it's not going to work. But if you actually just tackle it as a city, um, and this is where I think Singapore is kind of winning this battle because Oracle's got a headquarters here, Facebook, Google, Airbnb, you know, all the big global guys, you know, and about many of them in America, they pick kind of Singapore as their beachhead to kind of enter the market. Um, and that seems to be a playbook that is winning and, and is doable for most people. Yeah. You can, you can make the same argument as well that that's probably what you do when you, even when you go into Europe because selling into France Correct. is very different than selling into Germany or the UK, right? So yeah, you, you, you got to kind of pick country by yeah, country. And enterprise software companies have always had these playbooks, and they're generally the way you would do it. I think sometimes with the consumer companies, or, let's, you know, they think that you just kind of make everything available and you'll get it works. And, you know, we all know some products that happens, right? But, you know, I always tell people, for an example, it's not as easy as people think because, you know, as popular as, say, Snapchat is for you guys in America, I always joke with people, like, you just don't see it around here. Like, if I'm on the bus, I don't see anybody on Snapchat. Now, I see everybody on WhatsApp and Facebook and YouTube and Netflix. I, I rarely see someone on Snapchat. I know there's some users of it. But, you know, that's an example of, you know, it didn't just take fire in Asia, right? In fact, there's copycat products that have better numbers, I think. So, you know, you can't just say that these things will get grabbed by everybody just because they're a consumer product. And you can't, as an enterprise product, think that you can just get grabbed by everybody. Like you said, even with Europe, you would enter it kind of a city at a time. I think that's how you have to look at Asia. And I think what has changed probably in the last four or five years is people thought Asia was predominantly India and China. Um, and now what they, re- you know, a lot of people don't know this, but like guys like Google, I believe, make more money in the aggregate across Southeast Asia than they do from India, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of people don't realize how big Southeast Asia is. If you kind of add up all the countries, it's massive and it's very young, it's very mobile, and it's, it's got money at the middle class, right? So... So that's what's different for me that like four or five years ago, you might have just said, I wouldn't even bother with Southeast Asia. Why is anybody talking about it? Now a day doesn't go by. You don't hear someone talking about their Singapore plans. Yeah. And, you know, this sort of leads me to the next the next question I had. And, and I think you're probably uniquely qualified, given your experience on this one, is when you see a U.S. company move to move to, let's say they're going to pick Singapore to start. 
How do you build a team uh, there? Do you do you hire fresh? Do you bring over folks who have the DNA from the company in the in in the states to kind of help you know if you will transfer some of that knowledge? Or what what do you think's the 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 things to do and things not to do as you try and build that first team in in a foreign market? Yeah, I think I, I think it's it's definitely okay to bring some people with you, just like I got you know here by doing that. I think that's okay, and I think that sometimes you, you take somebody with the company's DNA who, who has aptitude to, to want to try a different region. You say, hey, do you mind doing that? Um, but generally what we see happening, like, you know, when Stripe or anybody else has opened up around here, you see them just going and trying to find a great country manager. But, you know, these places are so international, it doesn't necessarily mean that person is local, but it could mean they're just like me. They're an expat that's been here for many years and, you know, they're, they're moving around. So I think you definitely want to pick good leaders. And what we always see in our own startups and companies is this country kind of manager, region or manager role is very important because they're going to kind of run the shop and make all the decisions because, you know, with time zones and everything else, they can't possibly call for everything they're going to do. Um, but these places have become so international. One of the things I find very fascinating in the last two or three years and I've kind of called it the trailing tech spouts, right? So you have the Googles, the Facebooks, Airbnbs. You know, these are all companies with three, four, five hundred employees each in, say, Singapore. A lot of these people who might have come from corporate um, usually are married, and they'll come with someone else who's with tech. And we've seen a lot of these spouses actually be the ones that take some of the more edgier startup roles or new new roles because their husband or wife is actually ensconced in Facebook or Google and is, you know, can kind of can be the foundational layer there. So that's happening more and more. But I think, you know, it's, it's important to pick somebody who understands your company and who understands the region. Again, I don't necessarily mean they have to be local, but that person you're going to really lean on to kind of set culture and set the business dynamic because you know it's remote and you're kind of going to have to lean on them. So I think that, that angle is very important. But then apart from that, you know, it's like everywhere else. You're going to get recruiters that understand the place. You're going to do your company setup, and, and you're just going to, you know, slowly try to figure out where the market is for your product and realize that you might have some language stuff to work on. You might have some changes to your uh, terms and conditions to work on. And then the other thing I tell people is you might have to realize that you're going to have to adjust your pricing models a little bit or come up with different ways to kind of make a lower tier product, something like that. But like, if you just come here with your kind of playbook that worked for you in say Chicago, you can imagine that that's not necessarily going to work in KL, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the one mistake that you see keep getting made over and over again? Is it that sort of one size fits all, or is there something else that you think is, is just, you, you'd tell people, Hey, I've seen this happen X times. Don't, don't be the next uh, victim of it. Yeah, I think the one I see happening over and over that people need to be cautious of is one that they hand their business to a distributor. Um, you know, you'll see that a lot of times where people say, well, I'll use so-and-so in this country and I'll set up a JV and I'll let them do the thing. And I think in some cases that can work, but generally what happens is these people don't quite do what you would do and you end up not really owning your asset. So I think that's something people should be careful about. You know, you could maybe find a distributor to help you sell, but I think the one where you constantly, like, grow through JVs can be problematic. We see that happen. Um, I think the other one would just be that people don't have some patience. Like, you know, they, they assume if someone parachutes in and gets moving that, you know, in, three, in one quarter they're going to see some numbers. And if they don't see some numbers in one quarter, they, they call it unsuccessful. I think that's the other one because – you know, it might take you a quarter or two to get your head around the pricing model and the right way to talk to people and find the right person for you, and then a little bit of time to train them up. So I do think, you know, people need to have a little bit of patience. But, you know, yes, things are booming. Yes, it's busy. And, yeah, you can buy a bunch of Google ads and let everybody know about you, but it might take a little bit of time for the follow-through. You know, so, so to me it's that same old thing. you gotta, you got to come in here you got to find a couple customers that can be your, your use cases, your customer success stories. You build on those, and you expand. And most people who take that kind of a playbook and are careful about it, in my mind, will see something happening in the region. And what we usually tell people is, come on, you already have data. 
where someone might be using your product. You already have some notion of engagement. You just want to follow up on that and figure it out, right? Um, but some people kind of, they want to brute force everything. And then they think if, if that doesn't show, they should go back. Yeah. Um, that's one of the things I normally see as a mistake. Yeah. We got a little bit of time left, but I want to ask you one more question, which is sort of what technology or ideas are you most excited about right now in terms of your sort of your investment view over the next couple of years? Sure. So I think that, like, you know, our general view across Asia is, you know, and I don't know if this fits well with the state, but a lot of times, you know, we think the whole automation in the world is going to create lots of opportunity and havoc around the entire employment space, right? And so the whole gig economy thing just keeps moving on, just keeps steamrolling on, right? Where people are going to work part-time, but people want good employment, they want benefits. So we think, see things around even insurance for the gig economy, uh, tools to kind of manage people that don't work for you full-time. We think that's big. Uh, we think, you know, I know you guys are having your scooter wars and all those kind of things, and but, you know, what's interesting about a lot of the Asian cities is they're already realizing that a lot of the cities need to be kind of refactored around different types of mobility and even restricting car usage. So a lot of people may not know this about Singapore, for example. Singapore, as of last year, has already capped the total amount of cars that can be sold on the island, and then they're going to keep reducing the cap, I believe, each year. So you have countries like this that are already basically putting their foot down and saying, we're not going to keep letting cars rule the world. And, you know, so I think that's going to create a lot of interesting opportunities. Um, and just, you know, SaaS and marketplaces continue to grow, right? That, to, for us, that, we don't think that's going to change, that more and more things can be done with marketplaces and, you know, kind of reverse of the whole web logic story. More and more software is going to be sold as cloud-based entities. And we see a lot of niches for what that can be done in Asia with very specific types of things that can be sold cheaply on the cloud. But what you're talking about is a volume play, you know, that these things are, you know, we have some companies in our portfolio that it's a buck or two a user per month, but they're talking about tens of thousands of users per like install. Um, so stuff like that, we just think is going to keep happening. And, you know, maybe that fits with global trends and a lot. Of, it's just that here it's always about mobile first and it's always about alternative forms of stuff. So, even credit here is, you know, things like installment pays and things like P2P lending. Um, that's big here because not everybody has credit cards. No, that's great. That's interesting. It's fascinating. It's it's obviously, you know, different different stage and different culture and different trends, but it's uh, it does fit some of the things that we're seeing here um, in the States. Well, this has been great, man. I pr really appreciate having you on, and um, you know we're we're doing this, folks, uh, cross time zones, um, Redwood Shores to uh, to Singapore. So thank you for for getting up early in Singapore. Well, thank you. This is this, it's exciting. I really love the show. I've been listening to all the podcasts, caught a couple of the videos, and I think what you're doing is great. And I think it's cool that you get an Asian voice in here a little bit, and, and hopefully that'll. That'll give people some interesting information. And, you know, it's, uh, it's fascinating, right? Because I think I'm always trying to figure out what's happening there and how does it affect here. And then I think you guys are there saying, what's happening here and how does it affect there is, is always a kind of fascinating dynamic. Yeah, well, when you're back in California, let me know. You can come in in, in, in the studio. And when I'm in Asia, I'm going to give you a shout. We'll do this in Singapore in person. So thanks again, man. It's good, good awesome. chatting with you. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Great. All right. Take care. Thanks so much to Michael for sharing his stories and learning all about some of his adventures moving to Asia. Lots of great stuff I think that you're going to be able to take away and hopefully apply to your own business. I also want a big shout out to everyone who made it possible. Thanks to our sponsors, the production crew over at Oracle, editing at Lambstand, and of course, Kendall Fisher. Adios. You just listened to the Grow Wire podcast with host Jason Maynard. Make sure to tune in every week for another episode full of tips, tools, and strategies to take your personal and professional growth to the next level. Until next time.